Thanks for staying up later. Coming up, our program with Wilt Chamberlain, but first, a word of explanation. We taped this show literally days before the story about Magic Johnson contracting the HIV virus broke. As you're probably aware, the aspect of Wilt Chamberlain's new book, which has gotten the most attention, it seems, is his claim to have had sexual relations with some 20,000 women. Now, naturally, we discussed that with Wilt, and at times during the conversation, we took a critical approach to it, but we did it without knowledge of the Magic Johnson situation. The questioning, and I imagine some of the answers would have been different, the tone of it would have been different, had we known about Magic's tragic story. Rather than try and fiddle with it in some way, we've just decided there is no way to present it since we taped it before we had that knowledge, and we are editing that portion of the program out. Just wanted to explain that omission, and we continue now talking with Wilt about his basketball exploits, beginning with the night in March of 1962 that he managed somehow to score 100 points in a single game. The game starts, I'm fairly warm. I'm really warm from the foul. I'm not missing anything from the foul. That should have gave me some kind of hint that, you know. Yeah, you made 28 of 32 yeah. from the foul line yeah. that night, yeah. which is yeah. good for anybody and staggering for you. I appreciate that. Right, staggering, staggering for me, you understand? But I was even better than that the first half. I was missing nothing. I was 100%, 100%, remember, you understand? So uh, I said, hey, you know, things are going pretty good. And I had, I think, like 44, 41 points at halftime, and I was shooting well. And then the second half, uh, the Knicks... For some odd reason, fellows though that I was going to try to break a record against them, and they did not want that to happen. They said, not against us is he going to break a record. And so they decided to put a game plan of winning the game out of the bag and just try to stop Will Chamberlain. And I'm saying that to say that the second half was really, really belongs to the Warriors as a team. They decided that they wanted me to break that record. This is the Philadelphia yeah. Warriors against the New York Knicks on a neutral court for some reason th on yeah. this night in yeah. Hershey, PA. Abso abso absolutely right. And uh, they called it an individual record, but it was they went above and beyond the call to make sure that I got the ball whenever and wherever they could. I mean, the Knicks were fouling guys and trying to get the ball from them and said, keep the ball for really long time. If he gets the ball, foul him because he can't shoot fouls. And, but, you know, my team was much too clever and much too dedicated. And so when we got into the 80s, the people started cross chaining for 100. Well, by that time, I was really exhausted. And I had started to stop having a good night. I had started to miss. Even I got to the foul line one time and I missed my usual two in a row. And I said to myself, Jesus Christ, what a, what a way to mess up a good, good night. And I said, I might not make another, another foul shot the rest of the night. And I was really tired. And the people said, home, we want 100. We want 100. And I was saying to myself, you greedy SOBs. I mean, <laughs> I mean, what else do you want me to do? And, but it eventually happened. And, uh, and after, after it happened, the thing I can remember the most was uh, just a trip back. I had asked the coach, uh, uh, I'm living in New York, and could I uh, go back with some of the Nick? So we're driving. They came up by a car, which is a three-hour ride. And he said, of course you can. And I had a friend named Willie Knowles who was playing with mm -hmm. the New York Knicks, the one of their star forwards. He was driving, and another guy named Cleveland Buckter who was sitting in the back seat with another guy. And they uh, let me sit in the front seat next to the driver, Willie. And I immediately went to sleep. But I would wake up from time to time, they were talking about the game. And they kept saying every three minutes, can you believe that SOB scored 100 points against us? And then they were going to talk about how they try to do this and how they try to do that and blah, blah, blah. And then somebody would say, but 100 points against us. And that went on for three hours. And I would kind of like smile and fall back to sleep, smile and fall back to sleep. Finally, when they got me to my house, I lived on 97th and Central Park West, I got out of the car and I thanked them for, you know, allowing that SOB to score 100 points against them and also giving me a ride home. <laughs> <laughs> one minute and one second to play, he has 98 points. Back to Rockwood, into Chamberlain. He made it! All right, all right, all right, all right. He made it! The fans are all over the floor. They stopped the game. People are running out on the court. 100 points to Will Chamberlain. That year, the 1961-62 season, Wilt averaged, averaged 50 points a game. Mike Lupica said uh, a couple of years ago in an Esquire magazine article, the NBA record book still reads like Wilt Chamberlain's personal diary. I think five of the top six individual scoring games by anybody belong to Wilt. Two-thirds of the time or more that 60 points or better have been scored by an individual in the history of the league, it was Wilt, and the rest of the world has the other third. What's the stuff we've heard periodically, and it's only recently died down? Wilt could come back. 
Wilt can play 10 minutes a game in the NBA. Wilt is a special sort of physical specimen at age 45 or now at age 55 or whatever it is. He could still get out there. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I, I have been flirted with and uh, for many years, almost up to like two years ago, 80, 80 89. It's been really a, sort of a, a wonder to me that people would want an old 52 or 53-year-old guy out, out there on the courts. So, I mean, it's quite a compliment to me. Uh, it, it really, really is. But I think the statement is being made there that, you know, I can maybe still help teams. I could maybe get the ball for them. I also maybe could draw some more people in the stands. I don't know why they need more and more people. Most of the stands are already, already full. Uh, it's just, uh, I sometimes wonder, though, why they wouldn't ask Bill Russell to come back. You know, I mean, he, he was the, the real anchor for, you know, 11 world championship teams. And so I, I wonder about those, those kind of things. Uh, but as I say, it is complimentary. And uh, let's start another rumor. Maybe I, maybe I should. Maybe I should come back. When was the last time you went to the line and shot some free throws? Well, I'd love a piece of you well, there. Well, you know, okay, you know, I know, I know you would, but before you, uh, you know, you I know, have before, the touch. Before, I have the touch from well, there, Will. Before Wilt. you challenge me, let me say something. Let me go on record right here on, on the air, saying the last time I went to the foul line, I went to the foul line. I shot against a guy in Boca Raton, Florida, at a restaurant called Wilt Chamberlain's, which <laughs> I have a basket and a court inside the restaurant. Uh, legal size uh, shooter foul shot at. A guy challenged me. His name was Calvin Murphy. Played in the NBA. I think he even won a couple foul shooting, uh, you know, uh, laurels and yeah. titles and holds some records there. But then 90 percent. Ask little Calvin Murphy. Who won Calvin Murphy? Who won? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You come on. Who are you for? Ask Calvin Murphy. In fact, he got so angry. That I beat him in a game of horse, and he took me to the line, and all that, and, blah, 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 and we shot and shot, and I beat him on the foul line. That he says, oh, man, well, you know, well, okay, I, I'll make 25 in a row. If I make 25 in a row, can I own your, own your, uh, you know, own your uh, club? I said, sure, if you can make 25 in a row, Calvin. He gets on the line, he makes 22 in a row. I step beside him, Calvin, you don't miss the next one because you can't handle the pressure. <laughs> sure enough, he missed the next one. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but no, I beat him. I beat him. All that is to say that I, I'm a psycho. I'm a my head case when it comes to the foul line. I'm a good foul shooter. I always was. I used to shoot against Gail Griffiths and those guys who were in practice. I made shots in practice. I was just a... Uh, but in my, the game. I was just not a player in the games. But, you know, I'm laughing about it now, but it was a sad, it was a sad sight. In the game, it was... It was really sad. sad. I it mean, you sad have sight. years where you were averaging 35 points a game, yeah. but you were shooting 40% from the foul line. Away. Not 40. No, that's going to make it that bad. The one 40, year you 40, were under 40. 40. Get out of one here. One year you oh, were under 40. I'm a, hey, you I'm, know better than to question great. me on this, Will. Okay, I'll tell you Don't what. Don't get tested. I'll tell you what. I know. I mean, let me tell you something right here. I know that you are a very good man with stats, but I'm willing to bet you my shoes against your shoes. <laughs> what are you going to do with a pair of my shoes? Huh? <laughs> I'm with them in the East East Rivers. What I'm going to do with them? <laughs> <laughs> you understand? Uh, uh, that uh, I think 48 percent was like uh, my worst my worst worst year. I, I, I you know. But we'll but we'll but we'll we'll find that. Now out. listen, Bruce Cornblatt. While Wilt and I are talking, yeah. run up to sports yeah. and get a copy of the NBA record book. Right. And we'll check Wilt every year. Right. All right. Before check we out. finish this thing out. Definitely now, in you. Definitely in the in the, in the 40s. I'm not proud of that. That's not a you know. It might as well have been 38 percent, but it wasn't 38 percent. Not every. Yeah. Not for your career. No, but of course. One not, year. Not even one time. I'm not, yes. I'm not that bad. All right. I'll right, 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 hang okay. myself up. You. 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 You're true. All right. You. You. you from, the, from that 10 foot basket, or maybe from the foul line, I hang myself. <laughs> You, you mentioned Bill Russell right. earlier. Just like Ali and Frazier needed one another to define themselves, mm -hmm. you and Russell needed mm -hmm. one another for mm -hmm. that purpose. True? I want to say this about, about William Felton Russell. First of all, I think he was a much more all-around basketball player than people ever gave him credit for. Uh, the man averaged like around 17 points a game for his career. His career. That's only about like seven points or so less than Cream did. And Cream, we all know what he did offensively. Uh, his assist is right up there with some of, some of the very, very best for a career. We know what he did on defense, and to me, what he did most for the Boston Celtics was get them the ball when they needed it and wanted it. No one did it better than him. Here's what became the standard wisdom. Wilt was the best all-round talent, certainly for a big man in the history of the game. The statistics are awesome, but... Russell had the knack of contributing better to winning teams. His teams won 
11 championships in a 13-year span, uh, defeated Wilt's teams in the playoffs, I think seven of eight meetings or six of seven meetings, and four of those meetings went to seven games, and Russell Celtics won all the seventh games, although the four of them by a combined total of only nine points. But maybe that solidified the notion in people's minds that it would get down to a close game and somehow, although the stats would be on Wilt's side, Russell would have the knack for winning and his team would prevail. So people said that Russell was the winner mm -hmm. and the greater champion. Mm -hmm. Well, let's, let's, let's kind of like dissect it a second because you said something as I'm sitting here or, or listening to you and you're absolutely right. But you said we lost four seventh games by nine points. And you then say that Russell had the knack for, you know, well, whatever. But I remember how we lost some of those uh, seventh games. You know, Havlicek steals the ball. I don't, that, that's not Russell steals the ball. In fact, in that very game, Russell made a miscue by throwing the ball out of bounds up into the guide wires of the Boston Gardens, which gave us a chance to win, to, to win the game. Almost gave the game yeah, away. Absolutely right. And then there's guys by the name of Sam Jones, who every time a basket was needed right there on that clutch, Sam Jones would put the ball into the basket. And as you know, Nelson put one of them in there one time. That was the most ridiculous shot you ever wanted to see. Now, I am not demeaning Bill Russell, but suppose those other guys who helped him to win those little close games right then, it had been Jerry West to do something for us or, or Hal Greer or something for us at that particular time. But Chet Walker, I might have won four more world championships. But forget about the I might have. I'm just saying, though, because I lost those four by nine points, I don't see where that makes Russell that much better than me or where it should change how people feel about me as far as I am as a player. Even though I must admit, even myself, the whole deal is about winning. Understand? So if you want to like just talk about winning, you can't get past Bill Russell. If you had to pick one center mm -hmm. to start a team, mm -hmm. who would you pick? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that's another good one. You see, I think sometimes, Bob, that you can be uh, too good if it's a team sport. And sometimes that less is better. See, Bill gave the Boston Celtics what they needed. If Wilt Chamberlain played for the Boston Celtics, he would have taken away from maybe a Heinsohn, maybe a Sam Jones, maybe a Cousy. Because I could, I could put the ball in the basket, and I would take some of their shots away from them. And that might not have been for the perfect team. So it, it, it depends not who you would start it with, but if you started with Bill, you'd have to like surround him with a certain type of team. If you start with Wilt Chamberlain, another type of team. If Kareem, another type of team. So I don't think that's going to answer the question that you're trying to really get at. I'm pretty smart, aren't I? <laughs> <laughs> but suppose the same four teammates yeah. were going to be around. Let's, suppose, let's put it this way. Yeah, okay. All right? You can pick any four guys mm -hmm. you want. Mm -hmm. Who do you want the center to be? Ooh, if I could pick any four guys I want, then I got to take Will Chamberlain because, uh, you know, I'm going to put somebody around him, and, you know, and since he can do almost everything on the basketball court with the exception of shoot foul shots, uh, you know. Uh... Kareem, in his book, wrote an open letter, an open letter to Wilt Chumperlain. Now, th there was a history that preceded this. You had been critical of him, although part of the history, I should say, includes you taking him under his wing and taking him around socially and giving him pointers and whatnot when he was a very young man, and he was appreciative of that. But then the relationship soured, and you were critical of him toward the end of his career, saying he didn't maximize his, his talents, didn't give it all, all he might have sometimes, wasn't as good a rebounder as he should have been. Then he lashes out at you and says, I, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, am going to be remembered for having contributed to teams. And Wilt's going to be remembered as an individual who didn't contribute to teams and was a whiner and a crybaby. And a quitter. And a quitter. Mm -hmm. OK. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. That's what Kareem said. Yeah. Kareem has, has a right to, uh, to say whatever he feels. I think he went above and beyond the call of uh, being critical. Uh, in my criticism of Kareem, First of all, let's talk about how it came about. I would be maybe <clears throat> interviewed by uh, the LA Times, and we talk about the Lakers, and we talk about Kareem. I would say nine positive things about Kareem. Like if 
I had to go to someone in the last play game, give it to Kareem. He wants it, he does well with it. The tenth thing I may say is that, but I don't think he rebounds very well. I don't think he's really doing the job there that he could do and he should do. Uh, headlines next day is Wilt criticized Kareem for not doing his job, rebounding or whatever. So that's how Kareem began to view that I was maybe taking him apart in the latter stages of his game. And I must say this now, and I never said it public before, I, I respected Kareem, and I had a lot of guys who I respected in sports, Joe Lewis, Sugar Ray Robinson, Willie, Willie Mays, and a few others, Muhammad Ali, who I thought should have given it up two or three, four years before they did. And they lost, I believe, a lot of esteem by not doing so. I felt the same about Kareem. And maybe I was subconsciously saying some things about him so he could maybe give it up because I thought it was time for him to do so. And that was my personal opinion, and it may not have been his, and he has a right to feel, you know, maybe somewhat taken by, by that. Uh, but I never really went to his measures to talk about, you know, a quitter. I mean, I played in games and situations where I'm sure a great many athletes would never play. Playing 14 years in the NBA, I don't think makes you, makes you, makes you a quitter. Well, you had a stretch of time <clears throat> yeah. where you played 51 consecutive yeah. games without ever missing a minute. Yeah. And you had a season where you av actually averaged yeah. more minutes per game than there are minutes in a game because yeah. you were also playing in overtimes. You averaged more than 48 minutes yeah. a game. So what, what does that tell you, though, Bob? I think that he was just maybe a little angry or being misguided. And, and once again, as Bill Russell may have done, uh, just venting a little, little anger and saying something that he really doesn't mean. Now, from other conversations with you, I'm getting the feeling that at age 55, you've taken a step back from this and you've said, all right, I had my differences with Bill Russell and it hurt me. And he said some things which hurt my feelings. And I've had my differences with Kareem, and we've probably hurt each other's feelings. But now's the time to reconcile. Mm. I think you would like to make your peace. I'm not trying to put words in your yeah. mouth, but mm. you'd like to make your peace with both these men. Yeah, I, I think that, as yeah, far as I'm concerned, I've made my, my, my peace. If, if Kareem was uh, here today, I, I have no real animosity. You know, I, I don't, as I said, I don't think that he believes all those things he said. Uh, uh, Bill, it's, it's been a long time since we've seen each other. I think that we will probably see each other soon. People would be almost shocked to learn that it's been about 20 years since you've seen Bill Russell, right? Yeah, seen him. I haven't even seen him. It's maybe 20, 22, two years, other than on, on television, you know. Why but, do you think you'll see him again soon, then? We've had some communication through, through, through the mail, and uh, I just kind of think, you know, you feel these things. I just I feel it happen. Did he haunt you for a while, either when you were a player or shortly thereafter? The whole notion that as good as you were, his teams more often than not won and he was getting credit for being the winner, and you were getting credit for being the talented giant? You know, let's, you know I think you're being nice to me here. Uh, uh, and what I mean by that, he was getting, getting, getting a lot of credit for being the winner. I was getting, not credit, but accusations of being a loser. Right. <laughs> you understand? And that haunted me. Not Bill Russell, not the Celtics, but a tag of being a loser because we lost in a triple overtime to North Carolina, who was already seeded number one in, in, in the nation. It's when we, you were at Kansas. Yeah, and we were seeded number two. But we lost. It started this tag of being a, a loser. Then we lose the great Celtics teams uh, in the same division as we were in the playoffs. They were clearly the best teams. But because we lost to them, it was Wilt the loser. And that haunted me, you know, until the reprieve came in 67. You know, and I had a chance to uh, sort of like walk in peace. Yes, it did haunt me, but not Bill Russell. His one book, Wilt Chamberlain, A View from Above, chock full of interesting observations published by Villard. But this is the more important book for now, the official NBA encyclopedia. Look at this, 1967, 68. Uh, yeah. What is your percentage what, what it say? from the free throw line? What's it, what's it say? 38 Playoffs, though, right? No, no, no. That's the regular season. You 354 sure? out of 932. Is that right? You sure? You sure that's right? You know what? There's exception to every rule, and I can I can make a mistake. That was a foul shot I just shot right there. You understand? <laughs> that was a foul shot. 38 percent. All right, get me the rope. <laughs> get, 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 get me the rope. Get me the rope. Stand up and face it like a man. 
All right, you're right. I will stand up and face it like I'm right here. Now, just, just say see you later. 38%. And that was one of my best years, wasn't it? <laughs> no, I, you know what happened that, that year? You see, I was, I was sick. <laughs>